Please pray with me this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, truly, we're grateful for the opportunity to come together. We're grateful for the ability to laugh and to have some fun um, in light of things going on around us, Lord. But we're grateful that we can come and just um, dig in what you have for us. We're grateful for your word. We're grateful for your presence and your Holy Spirit, Lord. But we know we always need that draw back to you. We need that um, guidance to see what you have for us, the areas that we can grow and what you um, want us to learn and do, Lord. So right now we pray that you would help us come back to focus on your word, the importance of your kingdom, Lord. And Lord, we pray that you would give us hearts and give us vision and ears um, to have the right conviction in a culture of compromise, Lord. As we dig into the words in the book of Daniel here, Lord, and we see how he stood, we pray that we can stand and take action as well, Lord, in the areas that you would have us in our lives, Lord. So, Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Have you ever had something that really perplexed you? Like, to the point where you were just bothered by it. But at the same time as the fact that you were bothered by this situation... You weren't really sure why the situation bothered you because you didn't have a clear picture of the problem, but you knew that it bugged you. Anybody ever had that problem? Yeah? And no matter what you did, it just it ate up your time, right? Like it didn't allow you to sleep because you were bugged. It ate up your time throughout the day because you were thinking about the why when you had no reason to understand what the why was, but yet it took everything from you. It took your focus and everything that you had, and for some reason, it bugged you with no understanding of what the reasoning was or why. You just knew something was wrong in your life. You sought counseling. You asked some friends, hey, can you help me out with this? I'm really having a problem. And they kind of looked at you and said, well, tell me what's going on. You're like, I'm just bugged. And they're like, I can't help you with that, man. You're on your own. You know, and then you got those friends that always like to talk, no matter what the situation or the question you ask them. They give you their opinion, and you're like, this is not helpful. I am not in your place, and you don't understand the problem that I have. I would tell you, but I just, I can't describe it. But they give you their opinion, and they share with you, and they do stuff, but really, it is of no help. Maybe after some time, you realize, I'm going to start praying about it. I'm going to give it to God. I'm going to see what God has. And in that time, God reveals to you the truth that he has for you. He brings clarity to the problem that's before you. And he gives you an understanding. And now comes the choice. Do you take action with what he's told you about and the truth that he's given you? Or do you idly sit by and just let things play out in your life? Well, King Nebuchadnezzar and the wise men... Daniel and his homies, the four guys, or three brothers, they're at this place in the, where we pick up in Daniel chapter 2 today. There's been a series of dreams that the king has had, and it's caused a state of chaos. But we're going to see how one group prays, they trust in the Lord, they see what's needed to be done, and they take action to do what needs to be done. So as we continue through the book of Daniel... My desire, what I'm praying for all of us, is that we would have the right conviction in a culture of compromise. We would learn the truths that we need to to be able to stand when we should and take action, not just pray about things, but actually do stuff, like Daniel shows us. So we're going to go through it here. The title of the message tonight is A Kingdom Tale. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 2. I want to remind us our passage is a narrative book. So this is a narrative passage. In short, if you don't know, a narrative is a story told by a narrator with elements of dialogue. Does anyone grasp that? I had to learn how to do writing like that when I went to the Sheriff's Academy and went out onto the patrol, because it's this weird writing where you write like in third person, but you use first person talk in the same point in time, and you're like, wait a minute, what's going on? It's past, but it's present. That's how narratives are written and discussed. So we're going to be looking at today. We're going to look at all of chapter 2, all 49 verses. I prayed, I deliberated over it, I was guided, and I couldn't find a way to break this where the story didn't get us off track or we lost some of the meaning behind it. 
So we're going to look at the whole section today, the whole part of it. But as we look at this big section, the big picture, we're going to stop at the transitions and we're going to take apart and see what God has for us in those pieces. All right. So you guys ready for this journey? Daniel chapter two, let's pick up and we're going to read the first 13 verses. Picking up chapter two, verse one says, now in the second year of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Wait, we're going to stop for a second. Does anybody remember last week? few of you. Okay. Last week we talked into it and Daniel got taken into captivity with um, some of the other guys from Judah into Babylon territory. Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we know them by their names in Babylon, otherwise, um, were taken in. They were put into a school of training that took three years. At the end of the three years, at the end of chapter one, they come out of the training. They get questioned by King Nebuchadnezzar and they are basically put in as wise men. He found the guys to be 10 times wiser than any of the other people. And Daniel was also given the ability to interpret dreams and visions. But that's a three-year span as it ended chapter one. And right now it tells us that we're in the second year of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Does that bring confusion for anybody? Well, I'll clear it up just because I can. So understand this. Some things take place. Chapter 1, when we first looked at it, the way that it was written, chapter 1 is written in Hebrew, right? Chapter 2 through chapter 7 transitions into a writing and is in Aramaic now. So there's some differences there, right? Different writings would tell us that there's going to be some different things going on. What we can see that the big things would be like some cultural views, calendars, thoughts, and the process. So with this change of language, we can understand that Daniel was brought to Babylon he went under went training for three years, which we're told in chapter one of verse five. And then for three years, the training takes place. It ends at the end of chapter one. Again, Daniel's brought before Nebuchadnezzar, right? He passes the test. Chapter two starts. Well, chapter two starts and it says two years. Well, the transition happens, right? We change writings, we change calendars, and we change views. For chapter two, we're now in the Aramaic language. So there's some cultural differences, some different things that take place in that. Some of the things that take place is how they look at things and their calendar of timelines. For the um, Assyrians or Chaldeans that fall into this, they viewed the reign of a king a little bit differently than the Hebrews did. They viewed it in this way. The first year that a king came in was a succession year, which meant basically it was kind of like a training year. He was on probation for the first year, so that year doesn't technically count. And that year-long year is actually sometimes longer than a year because the way they also view it is when a king steps out or is taken out or dies, their reign doesn't stop that day. It gets counted for the whole year. Kind of crazy, huh? So um, this time when a king comes in for the first year, the succession year, it could be about a year or it could be a little bit longer than a year. It's a trial year and then the years start. We know that Nebuchadnezzar took over for his father, right, who passed away. So he came in, he came in in a partial year. He had a full year of succession and then started his reign. So we've come to his second, end of his second year of reign. So if we throw the succession year and we throw the two years of reign, how many years do we get? Three. Now, does that match with the end of chapter one? Yes. Is anybody confused still? Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's continue in it. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave command to all of his magicians and astrologers and sorcerers and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke and said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. You can already tell that these guys are smart, right? Did you see that they asked him to tell the dream, and the king's already asked them to what? He wants them to tell the dream to him. Let's keep going. We'll see here. Then verse 5, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut into pieces and your houses shall be made as ash heaps. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and the interpretation. Verse 7 says, they answered and they said to him, 
Let the king tell his servants the dreams, and we will give its interpretation. The king answered and said to them, For I, I know for certain that you would gain time because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matters. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such thing of any magicians, astrologers, or Chaldeans. It is a difficult thing for the king's request, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods who dwell, dwelling is not with flesh. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out, and they began killing the wise men and sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. The first thing that we see here is the unknown dream. With the opening understanding that Nebuchadnezzar was having sleep issues due to some dreams that he was having, he was also having a problem because he couldn't remember the dreams. But they were bothering him so much that he couldn't sleep. And it caused havoc on his life and it stressed him out. Because he couldn't remember the dream, he didn't know what the purpose was behind the dreams. And it really bugged him. As a result, he called on his magicians, his astrologers, sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to ask them to tell him his dreams because they bothered him so much. And these faithful servants, they were excited to show off for their king. When they entered, did you know the, how happy they were to see their king? They responded to him in like how any, you know, loyal servant would. Long live the king, right? Now what's your problem, king? Because we want to help you out, right? Total brown nosers. You know those people, right? They're there for him. But we're going to see, we see here that the wise men weren't so wise. Actually, they weren't wise in the sense of knowledge and greatness. They were wise only because they had a system. They had a con going on. And they knew how to play the system to appear to be smart. They would gather information. Then they would go back to themselves and they would collaborate and take the time and figure out the answers. And then they would come back and appear as if it was magic to have this great profound truth. But these guys were an interesting group. Here we see there was a group of four different people groups that came together, magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, and Chaldeans. The magicians, basically the term refers to fortune tellers, but some here seemingly find this associated with the people group of scholars, intellects, academics. They were the smart group in a sense. They were schooled. They had their education for them. Oftentimes, as much as they could have their education, they could be tied to the occult, so the religious side of things. So that's the magicians. The astrologers were the stargazers. They charted the courses of the stars and based the things upon it and made decisions and how things would go, much like astrology does today and how we would read horoscopes. The third group, the sorcerers, these were the spiritualists but not a good spiritualist. You see, these were the ones that were enchanters or mediums. They communicated with the dead. So you can see the group of people we got already going on, right? We got our intellectual side of people, the sophisticated, I went to school, Harvard League guys, right? We got our stargazers that wander and watch the way the things work above, right? We got the guys that talk to the dead. And then we got the last group, the Chaldeans, the wisest and most knowledgeable of the group. And this is the guys that talk for the group. Because you notice, they were the ones that spoke. They came in and met the king. They spoke to the king. These guys were knowledgeable in the science and the art of the Chaldeans and the Babylonians and the Assyrians. So they kind of had the background of the stuff, the science, the magic side of it. But to all these guys, as much as they had, they truly weren't that wise. You see, they had a system for the way that they went about things. They had manuals. So they kind of had cheats, right? Like cliff notes or cheater guides on how to get through things. You see, the Chalde Chaldeans were actually pretty smart in the sense that they had massive libraries with recordings of things that took place. So a guy came to them like the king that had a problem with dreams. They'd go and ask questions. 
they find out the certain elements of the dream. Then they would go back to their library, go to the dream section, and they would start looking through books, trying to find similar elements of dreams because what they had done is they had charted all this stuff. They had heard a conversation with someone about a dream they had, and then they watched that person's life. They saw how things played out in that person's life, and they wrote it down. They talk to another person and go, hey, that dream kind of sounds like this dream. What happened in your life? Well, that's interesting. So they had a charts, a way to go, and they grouped things together, and they placed it so they knew if they had enough of the right elements, they could make a prediction what was going to happen in a person's life. But the problem here was they didn't have the dream. They had no elements to go off of. They have nothing from the king because the king didn't know his dream. I don't know if Nebuchadnezzar had caught on to these guys and he figured out how to mess up their system, but he really did throw a wrench in their works. They weren't able to sit there and take the knowledge that they had and go back to the room behind the curtain, right? Do a little bit of hocus pocus and pop out and go, ta-da! It wasn't going to work for them this time. So much so that when they come to Nebuchadnezzar in this conversation, he, they're like, you know, we can't do that. Tell us the dream. Just tell us the dream so we can do the interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar, we get to really see his side of it. He's like a guy that really has two extremes right here. We see his first extreme, right? He throws down an ultimatum. Tell me the dream, tell me the interpretation, or I'm going to cut you into tiny pieces and then burn down your houses. I don't know about you, but just cutting a person into pieces would be shameful enough. The fact that you're going to burn down their houses into piles of ashes, or as some of the other translations say, a dung heap, I don't know what he's trying to put across there other than the fact that these guys can't be trusted, and look what they left behind, you know? But he goes to the extreme of, if you can't help me, you're dead to me, basically. They kind of rebuttal, just give us the dream. And he says, fine, if the threat of death doesn't work, how about I tell you this? If you can come to me with the dream... And the interpretation, he slides to the other side of the pendulum, right? I'll give you rewards, riches, and honor. Talk about a crazy workplace, right? Not anywhere one of us want to work, huh? You never know what the boss is going to be like. Nebuchadnezzar here, he's just, he wants to know so much that he's swinging across back and forth. One moment he's enraged and willing to put them to death, and the next moment he's willing to praise them and give them riches and honors, all so that he can know what is taking place. His mood is constantly changing. And then with one final pushback, these wise guys say, let the king tell his servants the dream so we can give the interpretation. At this point, they have sealed their death. No matter what they say, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, is not going back to the riches and rewards of heaven. He's going to the side of death. And he says, if this is the way you're going to be with me, then death it is. That's the only answer that you can have. And they come back again and go, no king has ever done this. Almost like when you come to plead to the boss, like, I, I get what you're asking, but this has never happened before, and it's not possible. We can't do it. Like, we don't have the resources or ability to go forward with it. But the king isn't having it. He's done at this point, and he says, fine, this is what it's going to be. It is death. He sends out the decree and it goes forth to start killing off the wise men, so much to the point that even though they weren't there, Daniel and his friends are lumped into that group. They're coming for them. As we hit here, we come to our first so what? And the question that I have for us is this. Who do you turn to for wisdom? Who do you turn to for wisdom? God reveals to us many different things in many different ways. We can read the scriptures and he can make revelations to us. We can pray and he shows us truth. He can even give us dreams to give us understanding in things. And dreams often do affect us in the way that they did King Nebuchadnezzar. We have a dream and it can cause us to have a toilsome night where we don't sleep so much because we're in a, a rage of not understanding what's going on. And it really forces us to the fact to understand that we are fearfully and wonderfully made as the psalmist said in Psalm 130, uh, 139. But the dreams that we have sometimes really do show us the deep dark secrets that are going on in our lives. They show us the mysteries and fears and ambition and passions that normally lie dormant, but that come to life when we sleep. And God speaks to us and he shows us things. It's not surprising that the ancients saw special significance in dreams and that they saw them to be powerful messages from beyond. But the challenge was coming in interpreting those dreams. 
Now, I'll be honest with you, when I became a pastor, I never figured anyone would come to me and say, hey, can you interpret my dreams? But you know what? It's happened. And I kind of look at him at first, and I go, hmm, that's, all right, I'm going to tell you this first off. I'm not a dream interpreter. God did not give me that spiritual gift. I can't speak in tongues, I can't interpret tongues, and I can't interpret dreams. And I can't sing. <laughs> but okay, let's go with this. Tell me your dream. They tell the dream. I go, man, that's a very vivid dream. It's very intense. It's very elusive. It's very all over the place. You know, I'll ask questions about the dream, kind of try to find out what's going on in their life. Like, where have you been reading in your scriptures lately? All right, what kind of conversations have you been having with God? What's going on in your life right now? What's happened that's of importance, you know? And, you know, the ever question, what do you eat at night before you go to bed? Because that pizza with pepperoni and jalapenos, I don't think it's working for you. They tell the dreams. Most of the time when they tell me the dream, I don't have an answer for them. I go, that is super cool. I never remember my dreams. I am so, like, sad right now. Those are cool dreams. But I point them back to God. The idea, what is God doing in their life? What is God trying to show them? What is God trying to speak through to them to get them to do? And I point them in that way. I am never going to dismiss someone that says that God gave them a dream. You want to know why? If I look at Scripture and what Scripture shows for me, I can see many ways and times where God revealed pe to people in dreams. In Genesis, Jacob saw a dream and the promise God gave to him for the land for God's people. In a dream, God appeared to Joseph. In a dream, God spoke to Elimelech. In a dream, God appeared to Solomon. In a dream, God gave Pharaoh a vision of what was to come with seven good years and seven bad years of famine. In a dream, God spoke to one of the soldiers of the Mennonites and gave the vision for encouragement of Gideon. That's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, God gave a vision to Peter on a rooftop saying, hey, guess what? Everything that I've given you is clean and you can eat it, which I am stoked for because I love bacon, right? I also, we also know that God gave a vision to John, an entire book, the book of Revelation. God gives visions. I'm not going to discredit that. But the thing is, when it comes to understanding and interpreting, we have to be careful who we go to. You see, he gives people the vision, the ability to interpret the dreams. Like Joseph understood and had explained to the Pharaoh that the fat seven cows that got eaten by the seven skinny cows was the year of good and the years of famine, right? Daniel was given the ability in Daniel chapter 1 verse 17 to understand visions and dreams of every kind. God gives the ability, but we have to be attentive who we go to. We have to be careful because we can go to the wrong people and get the wrong clarification. Just like Nebuchadnezzar did. He was quick to seek an understanding that he went to his wise counsel that wasn't so wise because the system didn't work for him. We can go to people at times because we want to have understanding. We want to know the truth. But the problem is, are they the right person? When they start to offer us, you know, opinions and words and things, red flags should go up. When the statements are, you know, I would consider doing this. I think you need to do, we should stop. Proverbs tells us this in Proverbs 18, 2 about that. It says, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. We got to be careful who we go to, the things that we look for, what they're sharing with us. Job tells us this when it comes to seeking wisdom in Job 12, 31. But true wisdom and power are found in God's counsel and understanding are his. With that, who are we going to for the wisdom? Who are we going to help guide us and shape us in the direction that we need to go? We have to be careful. With that, we move to our next section that we see here in verses 14 through 30, the unforeseen answerer. So let's read this section. We're going to read it in whole, and then we'll go back and take it apart a little bit. So picking up in verse 14, then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered, the captain of the king's guard who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to the captain, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then the king's captain made a declaration to know it to Daniel. So Daniel went in, asked the king to give him time and he might tell the king the interpretation. 
Then Daniel went to his house and made a decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in night's vision, so Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of the God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes the kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might. And now, I may, and now may know unto me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. Verse 34, Therefore David went to the king's guard, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. And the king's guard quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I found the man of the captives of Judah who will make known to you the king's interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I had seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers cannot declare to the king but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in latter days. Your dream and visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came into your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals the secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king that you may know the thoughts of your heart. In this section here, we learn that Daniel and his friend, the boys, had no clue what was going on. They were kind of outside the picture. But when the news was revealed to them of what was going on, Daniel takes action. He approaches the king, and he asks the king to give him time to get the interpretation. And the crazy thing is, is Daniel busted into the king, basically asked for the time, and he was gone as quick as he entered. He didn't wait for the king's response. He didn't say, okay, so what's your decision, king? Like, you gonna wait for me or not? He said, hey, give me the time. I'll give you what you need to know. And he leaves. And as he leaves, he goes back home and he tells his guy, the, the guys that he's with, start praying to God for understanding in the matters at hand. He doesn't break it down and have a gossip session, so like the king's totally tripping right now and we need to like bail him out. No, no. He comes back over to the guys and says, pray for the matter at hand. God knows what's going on and he gives it to him simple enough. And what we see here is the start of what we'll learn later about Daniel's life, that Daniel's life was centered on prayer, and truly was the center point for his relationship with God. As it says in Daniel 6, verse 10, he, Daniel, knelt on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. David had an active prayer life. He had constant communication with God. So when he went to God, it wasn't like he had to give the background story of what was going on because he'd been out of talks with him. No, he'd been carrying on these conversations. Daniel knew that the burden of time was important, that he cut straight to the chase. He got the guys with him and said, let's just start praying. Pray that God will reveal what we need to reveal. And that revelation was made known to him that night. In a dream, in a vision, God tells him what he needs to know. So much so that this results because of the focus of their prayer. In verse 17, it says, mercy from the Lord God of heaven concerning this secret. And that was the answer they received when the secret was revealed to David that night. It was to the point and direct. So often at times, we kind of get drawn out with long prayers, right? And I'm sure sometimes God's like, just get to the point, please. I, okay, I do that all the time. But still, come on, man, really? Because why? We think we have to talk. We have to share every detail. We have to go into long things. Only when we haven't been talking with God and we haven't been active with him 
we come to this thing where we're like, well, you know, it's been a time we've made God, so, you know, I'm going to lay this out for a little bit for you. So you got some time because I got a cup of coffee and it's going to be a while. But when we're in constant talks like Daniel was, we see that basically we can come to God in a moment. We can come to him with the least amount of details and know that he's going to be faithful to answer. And when Daniel gets his answer, he doesn't just say, thanks, God, and move on. No, do you see what he does there? He praises the God of heaven and gives thanks to him for the special revelation. Truly what Daniel did is he worshiped God in that moment. And that prayer that we see there in verses 20 through 23, he really worships God for his eternal wisdom and power for who he was, right? He worships and praises God for the fact that he's governing of history for what he does and the things that he puts into motion and the things that he plays out in the world. And he praises God and worships him for the fellowship with his people, making his way, God's way, known to them. We learn that Daniel really did understand what it meant to pray and to be talking with God and to be sharing with him. And these characteristics show us the kind of man who was faithful to God over time, was a man who was present in the high points and the low points of his life. He recognized that he was the Lord, not someone else. He understood what God did and the things that he did. He knew that God is the one that removed kings and raised up kings in the situations at hand. In verses 29 through 30, Daniel speaks to the king, and the, cra the crazy part is, is Daniel doesn't come in with fluffy talk. He doesn't come in with like rainbows and balloons, right? He cuts straight to the point. He talks to the king just how the king was talking to the wise guys at first. He hits them straight to the point, like, guess what, I'm here, I know what you need to know, so we're going to have a conversation or not. He's direct and thorough because of who his God was. He had the faith to step forward in those actions. And he spoke in this way that was full of grace, but at the same point in time, boldness. He understood that time was of an essence, but he had the sense of righteousness to speak the words that were given to them. And he wasn't afraid to hit truth where it needed to be. And Daniel goes on, and he doesn't sit there and say, okay, I understand the interpretation, here it is. He goes and goes, basically, you know what? There's a God, and there's a God of heaven, and this God has revealed the secrets that truly have been on your heart, the struggles that you are having, the questions that you have about what is to come. And he's revealed these to me, not because I'm wise, not because I'm anybody special, but because I asked. He gave me the answers that I could share with you the thoughts of your heart, verse 30 says. Through Daniel's address to the king, we can see his God-centeredness. He is centered on the fact of who gave him the answer, God in heaven. And he just didn't give him the answer. He gave him the answer to Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the question that he had. He focuses on the fact that it's the God of the universe who knows all secrets. That is the God that he shares with the king. And the answerer is from God, not from man. So what? As we look at this part, the question that I have for us is, how does prayer play out in your life? If we're honest, and I'll be honest, in most difficult situations, prayer is not the first thing that we go to. Typically, the questions come out, right? Why? How? I know I can fix it. Let me just think of a way. This is going to work out. Okay, what are we going to do? What do you got? Not prayer. Prayer is not the first thing that we go to. Often we respond like the wise counsel. We come in and go, oh, great God. So can you tell me what's going on so I can understand, please? Right? We're not sitting there going, okay, let me pray about this. Let's see what God has for us. Daniel shows us prayer is important. Paul encourages in the New Testament when he said this in Ephesians 6, 18, pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. We should always be praying. Scripture says we should always be praying in, from throughout seasons of our life. We should not stop praying. But sometimes we get off track. So I want to give us some things to think about when it comes to our prayer life and some ways to, um, reasons to pray. I got three of them, no particular order, but three reasons to pray. First, prayer makes us more like Jesus. And truly, we want to be like Jesus, do we not? 
So our goal is to be like Jesus. Prayer makes us more like Jesus. If we look at the life of Jesus, we see that he prayed. He prayed with others. He prayed for others, right? He prayed on his own. He prayed about situations and circumstances that were before him that he, he knows the answers to, but he still what? He talked to God. He had conversations with him. When he decided on the 12 that he was going to have go with him, that he was going to pull into his inner circle, he just didn't go, oh yeah, I know all these guys. I know how it's going to work out. He prayed for them, that they would be the men that they would be, that he saw in them. The second is prayer shows us the heart of God. Prayer helps us become one with the Father. When we're talking with God, we know we're communicating with him, but we're also listening to him. We're hearing from him as he speaks to us through the word, and he speaks to us in the things that he has for us, the revelations that he gives us. And the third, prayer reveals the wisdom of God. So often when we need to know something, we have to ask for the wisdom. James tells us that if any one of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So if you don't know something, what should we do? Turn to God. Ask him for the wisdom on what to do. Because we know how far our wisdom will get us, about two steps forward and face down flat, right? But God's wisdom is going to take us further in the journey. When it comes to prayer, I love what C.S. Lewis said. He said, I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping. It doesn't change God. It changes me. And that's what prayer does. Prayer changes us, but prayer has to be a part of our lives. And it was a part of Daniel's life, which brings us to the last section that we see, and that's the unstoppable kingdom in verses 31 through 49. Here we have the first time that Daniel basically his giftings come out and are shown when he interprets the dream for the king. And in doing so, Daniel goes on to tell the king's dream, but he doesn't take credit for the knowledge he has, right? He gives God the glory and he gives God the praise. And he's trying to get Nebuchadnezzar to understand that this couldn't come from men. It had to come from someone greater. So let's read the dream which is in verses 31 through 35. So let's read the dream. Pick it up in verse 31. Daniel says to the king, O you, O king, were watching and behold. So this is the dream that he had. A great image. This great image whose slender was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. The image head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partially of iron and partially of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron and clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floor. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. I'll give you some imagery to go with it. So this is an artist's rendition, but basically this here shows the dream, the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, his dream, the gold head, the silver chest and arms, the bronze abdomen and thighs, the iron legs and the clay and iron feet. And then you see a boulder coming that's not formed by man, but coming down and striking it. So we see... The dream, now comes the other half, right? The interpretation of the dream. Let's read that, and we'll talk about it. In verse 36 through 45, this is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it to be for the king. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And whatever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the fields and the birds of the heavens, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But, verse 39 says, after you shall rise another kingdom inferior to yours and another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron inasmuch as iron breaks into pieces and shatters everything that, and like iron that crushes that kingdom will break in pieces and crush 
all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and the toes partially of potter's clay and partially of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, and as the toes of the feet were partially iron and partially clay, so the kingdom shall be partially strong and partially fragile. As you saw the iron mixed with the ceramic clay, they will be mingled with the seeds of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break into pieces to consume all these kingdoms, all the other people, and it shall break into pieces because all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut of the mountain without hands, and that it is broken to pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known that the kings will come to pass after this, the dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. To describe the picture here that goes on, Daniel is able to reveal the dream to King Nebuchadnezzar. Upon revealing the dream, he's able to break down the interpretation of the dream. In the interpretation, Daniel again comes to the fact of everything that you have, the space, the people, the animals, the birds, the land, the area that you reign over is because God has allowed you to reign over that area. You're the top of this statue, the first part, the head of gold. But the thing is, as much as you have, at some point it will all go away. Your kingdom will no longer carry on. It will be taken over by another kingdom, it says there. The second kingdom, the silver kingdom, the chest and the arms. And though... Daniel doesn't tell us who this is. If we look to history and we look to the Bible, we know that this kingdom is the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, a divided nations, two nations coming in and conquering that take over what was there before them, building upon what was there, but destroying what was there. But these two kingdoms, though they're divided, they will fall. And they will fall to the third kingdom, the bronze, the belly and the thighs of the statue, which represents the Greek empire. And the Greek empire will rule even larger and bigger than what was before them, taking over and consuming. But as much as they are great, they will fall to the fourth kingdom, which Daniel doesn't name again, but the kingdom, the iron kingdom, many agree, and I can see through it if we, again, look at history and we look at what's there, was the Roman Empire. Because the Roman Empire came in and truly destroyed all of its enemies. It laid waste before it, and it grew even larger in the area that it consumed and did the power that it had. And in looking at this kingdom, this was the kingdom that was at power when Christ came into the world that time in the manger. And it was the same kingdom that when he went out of the world on the cross at hand. And the Roman Empire, though through its things, has hit a point where it has fallen. And there's a fifth kingdom to come. But before we get to the fifth kingdom, understand this. For all of this, for Nebuchadnezzar and understanding, was what was to come. For us, up to this point, is what has already happened. So we can see what Daniel has shared to be true by what we know. And we know that these kingdoms have rise and these kingdoms have fallen. But there's a fifth kingdom that's gonna come on. And this fifth kingdom is not here yet. This kingdom is the legs, or the lower part of the legs, the feet. It's a mix of iron and clay. This will be the last kingdom, the last Gentile kingdom, the last man's kingdom to rule. Some would say that this kingdom is already in place. I would disagree. This kingdom is not yet here. This is the final kingdom. This is the Antichrist kingdom, to be honest with you. And this kingdom will fall, and it'll fall when Christ returns for that second coming. And it will go down. But this kingdom, we have to be aware that it has not happened yet. People have their different interpretations and views. And as I look at scripture, and I like to look at things in context and see how they match up, and we talked about how a lot of the things in Daniel point to what takes place in Revelation. Daniel mentions the feet here. 
He doesn't mention the toes. But how many toes are typically on two feet? Ten, right? We also know later he's going to make mention of ten horns. What takes place over in Revelation chapter 17? Well, in Revelation 17, chapter tw- uh, verse 12, we read, The ten horns you saw are the ten kings who had not yet received a kingdom, but they will receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. We can see here that, yes, four kingdoms have come and gone. A fifth kingdom is going to come. But guess what the great news is? As much as that kingdom is going to come, it's going to fall. Because God's kingdom, the true kingdom, the forever kingdom, the eternal kingdom, is going to wipe out everything and start with a new earth and a new heaven and a new kingdom. So what? As we come to the end here and we see the things that play out in this passage, do you trust God? With what we can see and what we know, the evidence is there to trust God. But as humans, we have a lot of struggles. We have a lot of things that we have to work through and problems that come at us. And so often the problem is, one of our problems is trust. We struggle to trust. Because why? In order to trust, we have to give up control, we have to give up power, we have to give up pride, just to name a few things that we have to put aside in order to trust. That is the struggle, allowing God to lead us. Though we know the end, we know the victory, the problem is the process to get to there. We can't see it. We know the path goes this way, the hill goes up, but at some point the hill goes down, and things take place, and it pops back up, and we know the end, but we have to trust him to get us there, and that trust is hard. I was thinking through this, and I was kind of like thinking like so often in life, we want to know everything going on around us, right? But the problem is, so often we don't always know what's coming next. We know the end. We know what God has. We know through Scripture that God wins, and we get to reign with Him. But the thing is, what takes place till we get there? I got to learn a lot of things. I know that. I know God's got to work on us. God's got to allow things to happen, right? We know things have happened, and there's things to come, like we just saw, right? We have to trust in him to get us through to that. But the problem is we can't always see everything. And I was thinking about this in the sense of driving. When we get into a car, we have different views that we can see, right? We know our end result is gonna be wherever we're getting to, correct? And if it's, say, home, we know what home looks like. But as we're driving, we can look in the rearview mirror and we can see what's behind us. But if we focus only on the rearview mirror, what's gonna happen? We're going to crash because we can't see what's in front of us, right? But then there's the side mirrors. Those are helpful, right? Because they kind of let us know what's around us, next to us, and behind us. So, but if we only look in the side mirrors, what's going to happen? We're going to crash because we're too busy going like this, right? Bouncing back and forth. But then there's the view right in front of us. The hands on the steering wheel, the odometer telling us the speed that we're going and what we can see that's right ahead of us. But what happens when we focus on what's just right ahead of us? We're going to crash, right? Because either we're going to speed up or we're going to slow down or we're going to swerve and not look in the mirror to see what's next to us or we're going to stop and not see what's coming up from behind us. When it comes to God, God can see everything. And the great thing is that we have to be able to give things over to him and to trust him. Daniel gives us some practical things that we can see in order to grow in our trust with God and that we can become confident that he will lead us through the tough times. So I want to give you some ways to trust in God. These aren't in any particular order, but there's a few of them. The first one is prayer. Prayer will get us through the tough times. Talking to God, asking for the guidance, the wisdom, the things that we need, and communicating with them, we will grow in a relationship with him where we can trust him. Then we have grow in your faith. We have to step out sometimes. As much as it's great to pray all the time, we got to take action. We got to step forward. Daniel, we saw, prayed, but he also did what? He went before the king. He requested the time, and then he went before the king and gave the answers. He just didn't sit aside. And in growing in our faith, we establish a relationship with Jesus to trust him with our life now and our eternal security. The next one there, recall his blessings. This one I wish I was better at because a lot of times when I start to go through things, I never remember that God's gotten me through stuff before and I always forget those things. 
And if I journaled anything, it'd be great. Um, because I could remember and look back and go, hey, that's right, God did get me through this before. Which means this thing right now, it's not that big of a deal. We remember the times that he got us through, the times that he carried us, the blessings that he has for us and the promises of his enduring love for us. Where does God rank? God wants to be first. He actually gives us as the first commandment in Exodus 23, thou shalt have no other gods before me. God wants to be number one. And if we fully trust God, he's gonna be number one. But if we don't trust God, where does he move? Second, third, fourth, sixth, seventh, somewhere else down the list. We gotta have God first. Walk his way. Walk his way is walking in obedience to what he has for us. It's gonna take faith, it's gonna take trust, but as we grow in what we know of him, we're able to walk the path that he has for us. Daniel was able to walk with confidence into the king and to reveal the dream and the interpretation because he knew he was doing what God would have him to do. Give it to God. This is one of the ones that we also have a tendency to want to hold back on. We're good at giving things to God, but we're also doing good at what? Taking it back. Here you go, God. Never mind. Can I have it back, please? I know what you want me to do with this. Actually, I have no clue. Okay, here you go, God. It's a constant give and take game. We have to learn to give it to God and let him have it and walk away. Daniel was able to give it to God. He went to God and said, God, give us the answers for the matters at hand. He gave it to God. What did God do? He revealed the truths to him. He revealed the secrets to him. And lastly, remember God's timing. This is another one that I struggle with because so often when I get into a struggle or a bind, I want it to be over with quick. But the problem is God doesn't always work quickly. He's got his time. And in his time, there's a process. There's learning. There's different things that go on. But we remember when things happen in his time, there's a greater blessing in the end. And we work on all these things. It really does grow us in our trust for God. The chapter concludes with Nebuchadnezzar realizing that God is a great person. It says there that Nebuchadnezzar said, truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, the revealer of secrets, since he, since you revealed this secret. So because of what Daniel did, Nebuchadnezzar believed God was great. I think it started something in Nebuchadnezzar's life here, but I don't think it fully clicked yet because Nebuchadnezzar was still looking at Daniel and not God. But something is starting to take place. It ends out with Daniel and the guys getting promotion and placed over providence of Babylon. They didn't get to go home yet. They didn't get to return because God still had work for them to do and reminds us that God is working through us because he has something for each and every one of us. So we can't stop, we can't give up, we have to keep going forward. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for each of my brothers and sisters in this room. I pray for myself as well in that, that we all are going through different things, and I just pray right now, with the things that we're going for, that we would step out in boldness to you and talk to you. That we would give things over to you and not take them back, and we would allow you to do the work that you want to do through us, and that truly we would develop the right heart for what you would have for each and every one of us, Lord. So Lord, we thank you for our time, and we pray again that we would have the boldness and conviction to stand firm in a culture that is compromising around us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.